We've seen that electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation of ATP are coupled processes that can be chemically and even physically separated. In this module, we ask the question, how are the electron transport system and oxidative phosphorylation physically coupled? This schematic suggests a simple mechanism predicting an enzyme that would catalyze a substrate level phosphorylation of ADP coupled to a very spontaneous redox reaction in the electron transport system, much like the coupled reactions we saw in glycolysis. Despite looking for such enzymes, none were found. What was found was a role for all those protons that are generated by reactions forming NADH and H+. In those reactions, NAD plus is an oxidizing agent and pulls a hydrogen molecule off of the molecule being oxidized, but then splits it into a hydride ion, which binds to the NAD plus, and a free proton. This slide shows what happens when electrons flow from NADH or FADH2 to oxygen down the electron transport system. As electron carriers are oxidized and the electrons move down the electron transport chain, the free energy released powered proton pumps in the crystal membrane that pump protons into the space between the crystal membrane and the outer membrane. Some protons are shown in the cytoplasm in the drawing because the outer membrane, or OM, well, it leaks protons. But the bottom line here is that proton pumps have used the free energy released by the electron transport system redox reactions to create a gradient of protons. So, a proton gradient, in fact any gradient, stores free energy. It follows, then, that relief of the gradient will release free energy. Let's look at a prediction and a test of the hypothesis here that relief of a proton gradient is coupled to ATP synthesis in mitochondria. Here's one prediction. When isolated mitochondria oxidize NADH, or FADH2, the pH of the solution around the mitochondria should change relative to inside the mitochondrion. Here's the test. If respiratory substrates are added to the mitochondria, specifically NADH and oxygen here, the pH of the solution outside the mitochondria should drop as the solution accumulates protons pumped out of the matrix. That solution becomes acidic. Note that for this experiment to work, the solution had to be unbuffered. When this experiment was actually done, the pH of the solution did drop, supporting the chemiosmotic hypothesis. Let's repeat the experiment using Racker's studded vesicles. What would happen? Then repeat the experiment using his smooth crystal membrane vesicles. What would happen then? And here's a challenging one. Since electron transport can be separated from ATP synthesis, can you come up with an experiment to show that mitochondria can actually make ATP in the absence of electron transport? This slide lists some properties of the crystal membrane you'll see that the crystal membrane has somewhat unusual properties compared, say, to a plasma membrane. It contains more than 70 different polypeptides, membrane proteins. The proteins comprise more than 75% of the membrane mass. They contain a high concentration of the phospholipid called cardiolipin. It's a very saturated phospholipid, which means that crystal membranes are somewhat less fluid than other membranes. The electron carriers themselves comprise 15 proteins, as well as a non-protein organic molecule, coenzyme Q, that we saw before. The electron transport proteins are not organized in any particular order on the membrane, so that the rate of electron transport really depends on the concentration of reduced electron carriers, the number of these electron transport proteins, and the rate at which these proteins diffuse laterally in the crystal membrane. When isolated from the crystal membrane, most crystal membrane proteins lose any biological activity that they might have had. But it is possible to isolate phospholipid protein complexes that do retain biological redox activity. This can be demonstrated by adding electron donors or reduced substrates to these complexes in the presence of what's called a redox dye. Now this is just a chemical that turns color when it accepts electrons. So the idea is that the substrate will donate electrons to some phospholipid protein complex, which will in turn donate those electrons to a dye that will change color, allowing you to see the reaction. These kinds of observations led to the conclusion that the proper folding and shape of electron transport proteins depends on their correct association with crystal membrane phospholipids. Here's a cartoon of the crystal membrane showing the respiratory protein complexes as well as several other membrane proteins whose function is known. 
At the top are the respiratory proteins, or electron transport protein phospholipid complexes, labeled complexes 1, 2, 3, and 4, along with coenzyme Q. Again, these are shown organized so that you can watch the electrons flow, but in reality, they are not organized and held together in any form on the membrane. They have to diffuse and bump into one another in order to take electrons one from another complex. Complexes 1 and 4 and coenzyme Q use the free energy of electron transport from NADH or FADH2 to force protons out of the mitochondrial matrix. Because this process requires energy, you may recognize it as a form of active transport. The other crystal membrane proteins shown here are all involved in one or another form of transport of materials across the crystal membrane. Uniport brings pyruvate into the mitochondrial matrix. Antiport brings ADP into the matrix while exporting the newly synthesized ATP to the cytoplasm. Cotransport uses some of the accumulated positively charged protons to get negatively charged phosphate ions into the matrix without changing the net charge in the matrix. And finally, in another example of uniport, protons flow back into the matrix through the F1 ATP synthase particle. Here it looks vaguely like the lollipop that we talked about earlier to relieve the proton gradient.